1 Peter chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 12 to 16, and I'll read through these if you have a copy of God's Word and toward that's toward the back of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. For if for for excuse me, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory, let him glorify God on this behalf. So Peter is saying here that the sufferings that will come into your life and my life, he's saying the reproach in verse number 14 that comes into our life, these are all opportunities for us to bring glory to God. Now salvation, as you know, according to the Scripture, not according to me, but according to the Scripture, Salvation cannot be earned. We cannot earn any favor or any merit with God. That's not what religion says. Religion says we need to try to do everything we can to please God. Now, after we become a Christian, yes, we want to please God. We want to live for God. But we can't earn God's love. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 8, God is love. And so whether I obey him or disobey him doesn't change the fact that God is love. Now what Paul is, or what Peter is talking about here, notice verse 16, if any man suffer as a Christian. And so these things and these challenges and these difficulties come, he says, don't be ashamed of it, don't, don't to run from it in, 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 as well, but let him glorify God. Now, we've looked at the life of the Apostle Paul. We, again, this is lesson number 12. And many of the lessons about the Apostle Paul, there's a pattern. Maybe you've kind of seen the pattern, right? Paul goes to a city, and he goes to the synagogue, right? First place he goes. And he begins to, when it's his turn, and they let him, because they let people speak in this uh, setup, and uh, he would begin to speak the truth of the Word of God. And it wouldn't be long uh, before there would be some of those people that would really, they were really taking it in. And then there was another group of people who when they heard it, they didn't like any of what they heard. And so they began to oppose what he was saying. This went on time and time again. And that's kind of what we're going to look at in a little bit more of a specific way in this lesson, that we find that Paul not only suffered opposition in the synagogue, but they took it to the streets. He was, in, he was jailed because of it as well. And so uh, let's, let's take our Bibles now and turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. The first part of the outline, number one, is Paul's commitment. Paul's commitment. We'll look at Acts 21 in just a moment. You can go ahead and find your way there. Commitment. The Lord Jesus Christ sets an example of commitment in his life. 
I'm going to read a couple verses to you. Luke 12, 50, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened until it be accomplished? Luke 13, 22, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. This was part of Jesus Christ's Father, the God the Father's plan for him. And he shows us a level of commitment. Our level of commitment often determines our level of accomplishment. Our level of commitment often determines our level of accomplishment. You know, you can take that little phrase there and you can put it into a lot of uh, many areas of our life. Someone who is committed to something um, usually finds a way to get it done or to get whatever it is they're committed to. And now that we're 12 lessons in, I can definitely say, without even going any further, we'll finish the lesson, but Paul is definitely someone who was committed to the cause. And it wasn't that one little roadblock would come and get in his way, and then Paul said, okay, well, I guess that's, uh, that's it for me. I, I, I gave it a try. And you know, we can all look at maybe areas of our life where when there's a little bit of pushback, if we're committed to that area, we don't allow that pushback to detour us. We figure out a way, okay, you know, there, there's a roadblock, now what? Whether that's in a, our spiritual walk, or whether that's in our daily walk, if you will, and I know those two can be the same, but in our secular, even work, school, or whatever it may be. Letter A, Paul was committed to reaching people for the Lord regardless of the cost. Now, you're in Acts 21. Again, it wasn't always popular. It wasn't always that, uh, that you know, the, let's join the, the Apostle Paul fan club. I don't think he had one of those. Acts 21 and verse number 30, we read there in God's word. Acts 21, 30. And all the city was moved. And the people ran together. Try to picture that, okay? Not just one subdivision, not just one street, the entire city. And they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. I don't think we have room in here for the entire city of New Westminster, but, you know, kind of envision 100,000 people storming the streets of Hospital Street and Columbia Street, and just every street is filled with people, and they're coming here because the Apostle Paul has been preaching, and uh, word's gotten out, of it, and they've, the message is definitely one that they don't like, and they're going to stop it once and for all. That's what happened right here. It wasn't just, a, you know, that Paul got a letter in the mail that said, you know, if you don't stop preaching the gospel, this is what's going to happen to you. It wasn't that he got an email on Monday morning from someone that didn't like the message. It wasn't that at all. They came right to where he was. Notice what it says. And forthwith the doors were shut. Verse 31. And as they went about to kill him, Again, this, they weren't playing around. Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Again, it was the whole city. Who knows how many thousands and thousands of people had, were streaming into, the, into, the, into town and into the streets and lanes who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Boy. How long did it take the soldiers to get there? How many punches did Paul hit, get in the head? How many elbows did he get in the side? How many feet kicked him? Who knows? But for whatever period of time it was, they were obviously beating him. When it says they left beating him, it means they stopped beating him. Verse 33, Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him, to be bound with two chains. 
So he goes from a beating to getting chained up and demanded who he was and what he had done. What have you caused this entire city to be in an uproar? What did you do? Maybe this has never happened quite like this before, but it's happening now. Some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. Verse 36, for the multitude of the people followed after crying, away with him. And you, we won't read it tonight, but the next several chapters in the book of Acts describe a time of waiting for the Apostle Paul to face formal charges, giving him the opportunity to stand to declare his case before Caesar. Now, this is where he wanted to go. This whole time, Paul wanted to stand before Caesar. But everywhere Paul went, no matter what, Again, commitment. What does it take to prevent us as believers? Remember, Peter said, when, when, persecu when, when persecution comes as Christians, if it comes, what does it take for us to be you know, derailed, if you will, or uh, detoured, if you will, from following the will of God for our life? Not everyone is going to be pleased, sometimes within our own family, sometimes even within the church sometimes. Not everyone's going to be pleased with a bold witness for Christ. That doesn't mean you have to be ornery. We're not talking about a mean witness. But we see here that he was committed to reaching people regardless of the cost. Let her be. This is interesting. He was committed to rejoicing in the Lord regardless of the circumstances. Now, this is a little bit of a review. If we go back to Acts 16, we talked about this one a couple of weeks ago. Letter B, Paul was committed to rejoicing in the Lord regardless of the circumstances. Instead of being bitter, instead of complaining, we see a spirit of grace. How could he go through something like what we just read about? You know, you read that and I read that and we think, oh, wow, Paul survived a beating. That's pretty neat. But it wasn't just a piece. It wasn't just written in the Bible for, for, uh, like for us to read. He lived it. And I, I'm quite confident that in our world that we live in tonight, it's still happening. Christians are still being persecuted for their faith. And as I read the Bible, I don't want it to become some ancient history book, which, yes, it is a historical book, but it's also letting us know that, yes, something, uh, that there, there is something of great value that is worthy of my commitment. And again, just because some sort of opposition comes, of while it might be very personal attack on you or me or whatever, these things can happen, these things can come, but yet we must keep our, uh, keep our focus on the Scriptures, keep our heart in what God has done and given to us. There's nothing that I can give of greater value than what God has already given to me. There's no way I can be committed enough, all right? I want to be more committed. But even if whatever that highest level is of commitment, it would never match what God did for me. And so as we move into another week, as we move into another month, as we come, we're already halfway into 2024, and uh, as we move into different parts of our life, if you will, may God help you, may God help me, that when these circumstances come, it's an opportunity. Remember, it's an opportunity not to complain, but it's an opportunity to bring glory to God. 
And we see here in Acts 16 that Paul and Silas, when persecution came to them, notice in verse 25, again, it's a familiar verse. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. This is after being beaten, by the way. We didn't read that part of it, but if you read the previous few verses, you'll see that. You know, one, one thing about the Apostle Paul, as you've, uh, if, you, if you read through um, the book of Acts, and if you'll read through his epistles, beginning at, Gal- or beginning at 1 Corinthians and going through, one thing I've never found in the, in the writing of God's Word, which obviously is the completed uh, copy that we have here tonight, nothing's going to be added to it, but we never see a, a, a verse about Paul complaining Now, maybe he felt something, but it wasn't put in Scripture. I find that to be interesting. We never find him feeling sorry for himself. In fact, we read this verse this morning. Um, Philippians 4.4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. That was written by the Apostle Paul. So, this is a testimony of someone that discovered God's grace. You know, I was... My mother-in-law was texting me last night about God's grace. It was very encouraging to read what God has been teaching her about his grace. And, and a great reminder that the grace of God is not just for, for salvation. Now, it is for salvation. But, oh, let me tell you, we need the grace of God to live every single day of our life. Without the grace of God... Uh, I don't know what my life would look like tonight. Salvation, yes, but also as a Christian, it's vital. So, Paul's commitment. Number two, we see Paul's courage. Paul's courage. Paul displayed a courage that relied on God for strength. Letter A, under Paul's courage, Paul was courageous to testify at every opportunity. We read part of Acts 21, and we found that he was carried away by soldiers to keep them from basically tearing apart his body, if you will. And when he went into this castle, Paul asked if he could address the mob. And we see that in verses Acts 21, 37 through chapter 22, verse 6. I mean, the last thing on my mind, if I'm being carried away and I've almost been ripped, ripped apart, is for me to stop and talk to the people that want to kill me. But that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to address them. You can read that for yourself this week. You know, we, most people in this position would think about, okay, I'm glad the soldiers came. They got there just in time. I mean, they, he's probably still feeling the hurt from the, uh, uh, all the punching and all that he endured. And, and, and God spared his life, obviously, for a reason. But God put him in that place at that time. And those uh, that were in that mob, if you will, That may have been the only opportunity they had to hear the truth. Now, it takes some kind of commitment or courage, I guess we're talking about now, to stop in the middle of it and say, hey, I'd like to talk to them. And what does he do? He speaks truth to them. You know, sometimes God places you and me in uncomfortable situations because there is someone within our path that needs to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes there's someone in your path or my path in a difficult time, and because you're where you are, and they are where they are, God has put them in the path of someone who knows about the love of God. Think about it. And we are able in that difficult moment only by the courage that God could give us and only by the grace that God could give us, we are able to stop thinking about what it is that's going on in our life for that moment and we are able to let them know, hey, you know what? God put our paths together. I'd like to tell you how much God loves you. That's exactly what happened with Paul here. 
He testified for the Lord in a very difficult time. He was courageous at every opportunity. Let her be. He was courageous to trust God. Acts 22, if you'll turn over there quickly. Acts 22. He was courageous to trust through every opposition. Every opposition. Acts 22, 22. And they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting statement? Can you, can you remove him from the earth? <laughs> you know. Can you get one of those rockets from Mr. Musk and have him come over here, pick this guy up and get him off the face of the earth? I've, that's just an interesting statement, isn't it? Away with him from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes, these guys were bent out of shape, weren't they? And threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle. Here he is again and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. We're going to make this guy realize why these people are so mad. We're going to, we're going to scourge him. We're going to beat him till he figures it out. Verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And we're going to stop reading right there, but obviously God gave Paul something to say right in the middle of this. This is a very good question that Paul was asking, and you can read through the rest of those verses there, and God used this. Paul trusted God in every sort of opposition. This wasn't the first time Paul had been scourged. You know, he's not screaming and begging for mercy. I don't know that I would be able to handle it like he did. But he kept himself under control and by the grace of God was able to speak in such a way. So we have Paul's commitment, Paul's courage. Number three, Paul's compassion. Paul's compassion. Commitment, courage. But Paul cared for people. Look at Romans chapter 9, please. Romans chapter 9. In spite of the opposition, in spite of the persecution, Paul cared for people. And specifically, Paul cared for people that did not know about Christ. They did not know about the love of God. They did not know the gospel that changed his life on the road to Damascus. He cared for them. Notice what it says in Romans 9.1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He says, I have a heavy heart. He wasn't talking about it in a literal sense. He was talking about his emotion was, was heavy. Notice what he says. And this is, I've never been able to really wrap my head around this one. But for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying, if there was a way that I could be accursed means if I could be lost and hell-bound in the place of my brethren, then I would do that. Now, there's no way to do that, because a sinner can't die for a sinner. The only way we can have our sins forgiven is if by faith we turn to the, the only way to get them forgiven, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ, because he being God's son was sinless, 
He went to the cross as a sinless sacrifice for you, for me, for Paul. But Paul had this compassion, though, about him that he would say, if I could only give it up, I would, so that they could be saved. Again, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing uh, testimony. If you turn over to chapter 10, and maybe it's right on the same page. Verse 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that they might be saved. He didn't say, my desire for all of these people that have been beating on me is that they might be judged. He said that they might be saved. He said, if I could give them my salvation, I would. I don't know if you can have much more compassion than that. I don't know that there's any time in my life where I've ever thought, if I could give that person my salvation, I would. So then I would be accursed instead of them. But this is what he says. This compassion. Letter A, he cared for his captors. His captors. We won't go back to it, but we already studied it in lesson number 9, and we just looked at it a moment ago. The Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Remember when he told him, hey, don't kill yourself. Don't jump on that knife. We're all here. As well in Acts 26. Paul cared for the Roman governor by the name of Festus. He cared for King Agrippa. He told both of these men how they could be saved. One of them, I think it was uh, Festus, he heard what Paul had to say, which was truth, and he said, much learning doth make thee mad. I don't know if you remember reading that. Basically said, Paul, you're crazy. But Paul was preaching the truth. He cared for his captors. Let her be... He cared for his companions. He cared for his companions. Flip over to Acts 27, please. His captors as well as his companions. This is another instance where Paul is in a place where had he not been there, these other people that were in the boat may never have been around someone that spoke the truth. Here's Paul in the middle of the water, Acts chapter 27. Then we won't read all of these verses, but you can see there in verse 1, it talks about sailing. He's on his way to Caesar. Notice, if you will, in verse number 13, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocliden. They're in this, the biggest storm of their life. And he's on this boat. If you'll jump down to verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of, of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. He tried to tell them not to move on, but they went ahead anyway. To have gained this harm and loss, and now I exhort you, be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. There were 276 people on this boat. In that night, Paul had a visit from the angel of God that said everybody on board is going to make it. Now, the ship's not going to make it. The ship didn't make it. The ship got torn apart. But everybody on board made it, and they made it to that area called Gadara, and they would meet a bit of a crazy man there, but that's not our story tonight. But he cared for them. Again, I, I, I repeat, these were people whom Paul might never have met if he were not a prisoner. 
So this is a, a, jail, a, a jail ministry on the boat. 276 people, including him. I want to read this poem to you. It's called The World's Bible by Annie Johnson Flint. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongues but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. We are the only Bible the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message, given in deed and word. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy? with work other than his? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our tongues are speaking of things his lips would spurn? How can we hope to help him and hasten his return? Beautiful poem, a convicting one. His commitment, his courage, his compassion. Number four, his confidence. Where was his confidence? It wasn't in Paul. It wasn't in any people. Paul's confidence was in God. This confidence brought courage. Letter A, Paul was confident in God's ownership. We just read the verses a moment ago. For the angel of God stood by me this night, saying, fear not. Fear not. God, when God promised something to Paul, God came through. And when God promises something through his word to us, God will come through. Commitment, courage, compassion, confidence. Let her be. Paul was confident in God's goodness. I love that statement in verse 25. Be of good cheer. I believe God. That it shall be even as it was told me. Think about that for a minute. I believe God. You know, that's easy to say when, but he's in the middle of a boat, 275 people are around him, and it's storming, and it, the water's coming in the boat, and I mean, it's not looking good, and he says confidently, I believe God. Now, if they had been sailing on some beautiful ocean liner, and the waves would have been calm, sun out, you know, and a beautiful day, and Paul says, I believe God. Well, that's one thing. This is not like that, though. This is a very challenging time. But that confident statement, it's a challenge, and it's an encouragement to me. He was confident in the goodness of God. Psalm 107.1, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 119.68, Thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. He was confident. And lastly, number five, Paul's counsel. Paul's counsel. This is, this is I think, a great way to sum this up, this lesson up. Turn over, to, if you would, quickly to Ephesians chapter 6. Paul was writing to many churches. Paul was not a novice. Okay, Paul was not a newbie. He had been through a lot. So his writing carried with it, obviously it was God writing through him, but his story, his testimony carried with it some weight. So in Ephesians chapter 6, letter A, firstly, we see Paul's counsel to the Ephesians. What is his counsel to the Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That's the counsel that he gave them. These are what, this was one of his epistles 
that he wrote when he was in prison. Again, he's not sitting up in a nice loft somewhere with a, you know, nice window to look outside and getting the writing from the Word of God or writing from the Spirit of God. He's sitting in a jail cell. Think of that statement. Be strong in the Lord. See, it carries with it something when you realize this man is in prison writing this. He says, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. The, the main emphasis here is this first statement, be strong in the Lord. He's in Rome, he's in captivity, and he says to the Ephesians, be strong. Maybe tonight there's something in your life that is challenging. Maybe let's listen to the words of Paul, and you can adapt them to your life tonight. Again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It means it's profitable for you tonight, July uh, 21st, 2024, You can read that, be strong in the Lord, and you can adapt that to your own personal life right now. You can kind of think back and see Paul in prison in Rome writing uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to the church at Ephesus, be strong in the Lord, but he's writing it to you, he's writing it to me. See, that's the power of the Bible. It's a living book. It's not like that songbook. That's, a, that's fine, it's a great songbook, but that songbook's not alive. This book is alive, this is inspired writing. This isn't like Shakespeare or Macbeth, those aren't inspired by God. Beautiful writings and whatever, but this, there's nothing like the Bible. And that's why I, this, this was written thousands of years ago, and yet I can look at it tonight and I can say, you know what, I need some strength. I can pick up this book and I can be admonished. Be strong. Not in Ben Turner. Be strong in the Lord. That was his counsel to the Ephesus church. Number Letter B, his counsel to the Philippians was in Philippians chapter 4. We, 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 we covered a bit of this this morning. Philippians chapter 4. And his counsel to the Philippians was at the end of verse 8. The end of verse 8, Paul writes, Think on these things. Earlier today, I had a conversation with a brother in Christ, a couple of them, and uh, basically part of the conversation was revolving around how the devil attacks our mind. How many of you know the devil attacks your mind? Yeah, if you don't know that, believe me, he does. He attacks the way we think. So here's an admonition from Paul in Rome, now to Philippi. And he says to them at the beginning of verse 8, here's some things to think about. (laughs) Things that are true and honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise... Think on these things. Think in a way that honors God. I like what Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth, to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 10.5. He said, casting down imaginations. Now see, that's where the devil specializes in many times. Is he tries to get up in my head and put an imagination in there. You know what imagination is? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not true. It's just an imagination. Now, it's not wrong to have an imagination about certain things. But the devil tries to put imaginations in my mind that God doesn't love me. The devil tries to put imaginations in my mind that God isn't going to take care of me. And you can go on and on. And believe me, the list is, the list is lengthy. And he attempts to do that. And if we start to dwell on 
those imaginations, because again, we have scripture that disproves what I just said, that the devil, uh, that, that God doesn't love me and he won't take care of me. No, we have scripture that disproves that. So I'm not to think on the imaginations, I'm to think on these things. And what happens is, great peace comes over, and I'm quickly reminded that Satan is a liar and the father of and the father of it casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ think on these things let her see to the colossians colossians chapter 3 thank you for your attention just about done don't miss these last couple things, though. Let her see to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. What does he write to them? All right, we'll just actually skip ahead and go to verse 2. Here's what he writes to them. Here's his counsel. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That's the counsel. The wise Christian is more concerned with the eternal than with the temporal. I had somebody tell me that today too. Amazing how God does this. <laughs> somebody was preaching to me and I didn't even know it, I guess. Hold loosely to the things of this world. Lastly, letter D. His counsel to Timothy. Remember, Paul discipled Timothy. And Timothy took the baton, if you will, from Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4. What was his counsel to 2 or to 2 Timothy? What was his counsel to Timothy? Well, he said various things, but the one we're going to emphasize tonight is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2. Three words. Preach the word. He was telling Timothy, I want you to do exactly what I have done. This is what Paul did at the calling of God on his life. To preach the word. In other words, I could stand up here and give you 45 minutes of Ben Turner's opinions on life. And that's going to get you maybe a coffee. The value of a coffee. But when we open this up, as we've looked at many texts tonight and tried to emphasize God's word over our word, then the value, you can't put a price tag on it. So that's what he said. He said, Timothy, when you go out into the highways and byways, it's not about Timothy, it's about the word. And I would encourage us with that tonight. The world we need doesn't necessarily need, even though we have a bit of an outline and all that, they don't need an outline as much as they need the Word. They don't need a, a, you know, a story. Yes, sometimes stories are good and illustrations, but they need the Word. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 about itself that the Word of God is quick and powerful, meaning it's alive, as we said earlier. It's quick, it's alive. Jeremiah 23 is not my word. Verse 29 is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. That was Paul's counsel to Timothy. No prison on earth could contain the spirit of the Apostle Paul. He continued to serve God regardless of the circumstance. Many times in jail, Many times beaten, but every time it would seem, taking that situation, doing all he could do to bring honor and glory to God. 